I am Bill Stoltz with the Kenton County Public Library and today is Monday, September 26, 2016. I will be interviewing Roger Vian at the Covington Library in Covington, Kentucky. The other person attending the interview is our videographer Mike Bloom of the Kenton County Public Library. This interview is being conducted for the Kenton County Public Library Veterans Project in conjunction with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Good afternoon, Mr. Vian. Could you please state your full name, birth date, branch of service, highest rank attained, and your dates of service? All right. Roger J. Vian. Uh, my date of birth? Yes, sir. Okay, 9 March 1940. Uh, entered the Army in uh, February 17th, 1960, and got out of the Army in March of 1967. My only overseas service was Vietnam in 1964. In 1965, I attained the rank of Chief Warrant Officer II, and in Vietnam, I was with the 18th Aviation Company. Great. Um, where were you born, and what were your parents' names? I was born in Enon Valley, Pennsylvania, which is just about 35 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. My father, who is still alive at 100, Wow. is Roy H. Vion, and he lives in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania now. My mother died a few years ago at age 92. Longevity. Her, her name was Betty Evelyn Nepp prior to becoming Betty Vion. And what were their occupations? My dad was um, with Babcock and Wilcox for a number of years as a machinist, and uh, then he got into strip mining with his brother, and they mined coal and clay in western Pennsylvania. And where Ralph A. Vion Incorporated was the name of the company my uncle had. And did your mother work or did she stay at home? My mother uh, worked most of the time. Well, when I was a kid, she worked cleaning people's houses. And I remember we'd come home from school and she'd have a piece of pie or something waiting for us. And at that time, she was, I was in the 50s, she was charging $6 a day. And um, I said it. And um, did you have siblings? I have a brother, Roy C. Vion, uh, younger than me, a um, year and a half younger than me, a year and nine months, actually. And um, a sister who's uh, four years older than me, Joanne Hansen now, and she lives in Massachusetts. She's 80. My brother's uh, 75. And where did you go to school? I went to grade school in uh, Chippewa Township, Pennsylvania. Went to high school in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania better known for Joe Namath country. He's a little younger than me, but uh, same school. He was there when I was there. And then I went to uh, college one year at Covenant College, which at that time was in St. Louis, Missouri. It's still the site of the Covenant Seminary, but the college has moved to uh, Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. And the next year I went to college at Malone College which is a Quaker college in Canton, Ohio, previously had been uh, Cleveland Bible Institute. Uh, on spring break in 1960, I got sideswiped in a hit and run by a lady. I chased her down, ended up stopping her in front of the post office in Canton, Ohio, and said, I want you in the United States Army. So I went in and talked to him. That's how I got in the Army. So this was spring break of your sophomore year in college? Right. Um, so did you enlist immediately, or did you wait a, a couple weeks, couple days? Well, I went in and talked to this guy in the post office, and he said, have you ever been on a train trip? And I said, no. He said, I'll give you a ticket to take a train trip to Cleveland. That's where we have our big place to check out and see what you can do in the, in the Army. Well, that sounds fun. And I'm going to give you a chit so you can have a hotel room in Cleveland. Wow, I've never been in a hotel by myself. And I'm going to give you these other chits for meals. This is pretty good. So went up, took the test, 
And they said, you can do anything you want in the United States Army. And I did, wanted to be in the medics. I wanted to be a medical lab technician. They said, six months, wait. I said, well, I've kind of made up my mind I want to go. They said, uh, I said, how about x-ray technician? They said, good, you can do that. Three months, wait. I said, well, what have you got in the medical field? They said, dental specialist. I said, what's that? Don't know, but you got to be a medic first, and then you can be this. Ended up being a dental assistant, and that's the way I ended up in the Army. Okay. <laughs> Had you been studying medical sciences in college, or was this just something you wanted to do? I kind of was interested in going the technical way rather than the college way, and that was my idea of how to get into that type field. So did you then enlist in Cleveland? No, I uh, actually, I think I enlist. I can't remember. I think I enlisted with that recruiter in Canton, Ohio. Okay. And they sent me to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And that's where I had basic training with the 6th Armored Cavalry. Okay. And um, what was that like? It was really good for me because I was, um, I was a yeah, but. You know what that is? No. That's somebody that says, yeah, but I'd talk back to I'd always have a reason for everything I was going to do. They weed that out of you pretty darn quick. And uh, so it was a experience that way. And also found out, because the Army is such a big organization, that it's real easy to look good. And if you're willing to apply yourself. And so they'd make me acting squad leader, acting this and stuff like that. And I was a 145 pound little kid and it was kind of neat. Now you're, and you don't call anybody a kid or a boy or anything else. It's one of the troopers in the cavalry. And uh, it changed your whole outlook on who you were and what you were. So it gave you a lot of confidence then. A lot of confidence. By that time, by the time I was in, I had already memorized all my general orders and the code of conduct and stuff like that. So that put me way ahead of a lot of guys who weren't good at memorizing things. But and I could still probably do most of the order general orders now, although they've changed over the years. Mm -hmm. The code of conduct has changed dramatically since the code of conduct had just come out. Because in Korea, we had problems. Guys didn't know how to handle themselves. We had turncoats and people turning on one another and stuff like that. So they come out with a code of conduct. And uh, that changed again dramatically after the way people were treated in Vietnam. Because now they give you more leniency to cooperate to some extent. Because uh, the system I was under, you'll continue to resist by all means available and so on. Sometimes that's not going to result in longevity. Mm -hmm. And that was resisting against the enemy or? Right. They're, okay. they're your captors, if you were taken okay. prisoner. That was assuming you were taken prisoner. Yeah. Um, so how did you adapt? You mentioned uh, how you picked up. How did you adapt to the training in the military life? It sounds like fairly well. I enjoyed it, and I made... Um, I made E5 in, in just under two years, which is still significantly quick. And so I, every time it was time for a promotion, and most of the first three promotions in the military are just based on time. You're there, you spend your time, you keep your nose clean, you get promoted. But E5, they kind of look at you. And then E6, I was just going up for E6 or staff sergeant. and. Uh, I missed it once, and then I came in one day, and a friend of mine told me about flight school, and I decided to switch into flying. Okay, so you, you went to boot camp. Did you ever make it to dental school? Oh, yes. After boot camp at, at Fort, uh, Knox. Fort Knox, Kentucky, my next assignment was Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Oh. Fort Sam Houston is a medical field service center for the United States Army. And uh, I went to, became a medic, carrying a litter, taking blood pressure, 
crawling under the wire, you know, the type of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like basic, but as a medic. Learn how to take blood pressure, take blood, um, basic life-saving things. And that was eight weeks. Basic training when I went was eight weeks. I believe it's a little longer now. It might be 12 weeks. And then uh, basic medic was eight weeks. Then after you went to basic medics, if you were going to be still continue as a medic, your second phase would be another eight weeks. But instead of going to that, I went to dental specialist school or dental assistant. It's like a chairside assistant. Mm -hmm. You lay out the stuff, you help the dentist, you take x-rays, you develop x-rays, and uh, that kind of thing. So you went, then you went through dental training, and you mentioned pi pilot school? Right. But when, pilot school. when in dental training, though, here's what I liked about the Army. I was eight weeks basic training, eight weeks as being a medic training, eight weeks as being a dental assistant, and just as we were about to graduate, they asked a top three of us. I happened to be our class leader, and I was the highest academically in our class because I found it interesting. I'd, I'd apply myself, and uh, they asked us if we wanted to stay and be instructors. By this time, I'd already decided I didn't think I'd like to be a dental assistant. So the colonel... Wow, almost had his name... <laughs> Uh, called me in to interview whether I would stay on as an instructor, Barone, Colonel Barone, Lieutenant Colonel. And he said, why do you want to stay here? And I said, well, I don't really think I'd like to do this in a field, but I think I could teach people to do it mm -hmm. better than I actually do it. And uh, he said, nobody has ever said that to me before. I said, well, that's the truth. I figure if I go out in the field, I couldn't get back here. But if I for some reason don't make it here as an instructor I can always go to the field and they kept me as instructor now I had eight weeks instructor training in it this army's pretty cool you just go to school mm -hmm. then uh, then I started training people to be dental assistants and after doing that for two years I came in one day and a friend of mine both started the same day in the army Edward Boyce died just not too long ago at a VA hospital in Georgia. That's too bad. Having surgery. Uh, Ed said, Raj, I'm not going to flight school. I'm going to nuclear power plant operator school. That's the longest school the United States Army has. They don't have it anymore because they decided not to go into the nuclear power plant business. But he went in that school, and it's so long he had to break it up because there's a length of time a school is allowed to be had, but they made it into two pieces, but it was really one school. He went through that school, and then when the Army decided they weren't going to be in nuclear power plants, um, do you know where a nuclear power plant school is by any way? I do not. Well, the U.S. Navy has nuclear power plant school, exactly where you think it would be, Idaho. I, I wouldn't have guessed Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where you'd think it would be for the Navy, mm -hmm. Idaho. So anyway, he went into nuclear medicine, and uh, he stayed 20, was a master sergeant. Another buddy of mine that went with him to that same school uh, spent quite a few years in Korea. He retired. He's dead now, too. Uh, he died of diabetes right after he retired and he was a command sergeant major but it, I said Ed what's this about flight school he had all the flight school information there every place that said Ed Boyce I crossed it out put my name in <laughs> two weeks later I was in an H-13 helicopter getting my 15 minute ride to see if I got air sick and I didn't a couple weeks after that I was on my way to flight school at Fort Rucker Alabama did anybody ever catch that you had penciled your name in, or that I was that you had penciled your name in on his? No, no, that was ha they were happy with it. And the interesting thing was, I remember going by train to Fort Rucker, Alabama. I was still at Fort Sam Houston, and I was thinking, if I was in my helicopter, I'd be going up and down over these things and so on. See, I thought I was in helicopter school. I got there, I wasn't in helicopter school. I was in airplane school. Oh, so I was flying airplanes. 
and uh, 42 weeks of flight school, graduated. And while we're in flight school, they were having a, a uh, classified briefing one day. And my security clearance and another fellow's security clearance had not come through. So we had to sit out and we're all waiting. Some buddies of ours came out and we said, uh, I know you can't tell us anything about the briefing, it's classified, but what's the subject? They said, it's about the conflict in Vietnam getting going. I said, well, I can guarantee you one thing. Since I didn't get to go to the briefing, I know where I'm going, <laughs> Vietnam. And that's where I got my orders for as we graduated. In those days, when you, when you were a warrant officer candidate, you went through as basically an enlisted status mm -hmm. and flight school at the same time. They don't do it that way anymore. So you're doing PT, you're running, and you're getting, you're doing all these push-ups, drop, give me 20. Uh, had to do uh, 10 pull-ups before you could go into the chow hall. You ate a square meal. You had to lock your eyeballs when you're eating. And if you otherwise they get you for greasy eyeballs and do all kind of things you uh, it was interesting and it developed in you they have all these different uh, inspections mm -hmm. white glove inspections and in command and they go out of their way to for example they found dust above your window they would take a grease pencil and go all the way across your polished floor all the way up your wall all the way over with a little arrow pointing and then right on the wall in grease pencil, dust. Now you don't just clean the dust off, you gotta scrub your wall, scrub your floor, re-wax it the whole bit. That's the type of thing we're in. Every day was a white collar inspection, not where you just make your sheet into a white collar, but you have to remove your sheet, make a fake white collar and have it on. So How you'd come up with stuff like you have your laundry bag tied to the end of your bunk. We'd add a zipper in it so we could not ever have to untie it, mm -hmm. save yourself some time. Your boots, you'd put a zipper in the side of them so you could leave them laced and so on and so forth like that. So uh, you found ways around. You found ways to make the system work for you. And it went so far as, for example, if they're looking at your uniform and you happen to have a little string sticking out, they would come up to you and say, candidate, you have a lanyard there. May I pull that lanyard? And a lanyard like you're firing a, a field piece. And you'd get so you'd start to mess with them, like you'd intentionally have a string there. And they'd say, may I pull that lanyard? Sir, can they be on? Yes, sir. And they'd pull the lanyard, and you were supposed to go boom and back up as if you were a camp piece. I went, whoo. They said, what's that? Clear on the right, clear on the left. We have a hung round, hung round. And I would go through that whole thing. I'd just crack these guys up because they weren't used to it, somebody. But by that time, we were so far along, and I was so far in debt on demerits mm -hmm. that I was out doing what they called taxi time, which they'd have you marching back and forth across the parade ground. There were about half a dozen of us that kept getting in trouble for one reason or the other. So I had all these demerits I was trying to march off right till practically graduation. And uh, one time I remember taking a OD thread, drop it down my shirt and pull it out through. So that they pull it. And after they pull about two feet of it, they realize you just got them, but you're gonna pay for it. You realize that you're gonna be doing, they can only do so many push-ups, and you're down and they get you in what they called at that time, the dying cockroach position. When you couldn't push up anymore, they have you lay on your back with your head up, your arms up, and your feet up. The dying cockroach position. You hold that as long as you could. That sounds strenuous. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you were also doing flight training at the same time. You yeah, were... and we graduated and got our wings and our W-1 bars at the same time. The way the Army does it now, in fact, I just read a very interesting book by a gal that flew armed helicopters in both Iraq and Afghanistan, um, a helicopter that they just uh, retired, the Kiowa Warrior, a jet-powered mm -hmm. uh, helicopter. She went from high school to warrant officer candidate school to flight school. 
but they put them through a basic training and then another similar to basic training warrant officer school, and then they got their bars. And then they went through flight school as an officer. That'd be entire. That'd be so cool. I'd be pretty laid back. Yeah, and probably it treated. It wasn't like what we did. Treated very differently. But we started with like 150 guys, and I think 62 of us graduated. Ah, that's less than half. Oh yeah. Was it the training and also the? Mostly SIE, self-initiated elimination, quit. Sort of like the seals ring the bell. Mm -hmm. Ours wasn't that kind of training, but it was. You decide on your own you're not going to do it anymore. Some guys got air sick and kept getting air sick or just decided they weren't going to put up with it anymore. When we first arrived at Warren Officer Training School down in um, Fort Rucker, a friend of mine and I were already upstairs where we were going to be in this barracks, and we saw two Special Forces guys, like Sergeant First Class all their ribbons and everything on these guys have been in combat already and uh no they hadn't been in combat couldn't have been i don't know how they, they might have been as far back as korean guys mm -hmm. yeah, could have been because they were pretty well decorated up they came in that front door and that's where you drop and start doing that that taxi hadn't that they came in hadn't even pulled out yet when they left they quit. Wow. Ten minutes into Warren Officer Candidate School, they said, I'm not doing this. They quit. So it's a very interesting situation. That is, and how it's transitioned over time. And, like, I was never that strong. But I worked, had, you know, I could do 20, 25 push-ups, something like that, which for me was pretty good. We had one guy, Nichols. He was the only guy in our class that was killed in Vietnam that I know of. Uh... He got recycled then, but he was a um, paratrooper and a, um, what's the guy's a par parachute in ahead of time? Oh, like the Pathfinder? He was a Pathfinder, what had that Pathfinder mm -hmm. little torch that they have on his unit. So he, he was been around, he was a tough guy. He could do 150 push-ups. Wow, that'd be pretty impressive to see. Well, they'd always want him to do 151. <laughs> It didn't matter what you could do, you were all going to end up laying on the ground. And they just pushed you to you. That's just the Army way of doing it. So everybody's going to end up in the same place, your dirt facing the dirt. So um, I just got there easier. <laughs> <laughs> so during flight school, what kind of planes did you fly? In flight school, the um, it was two phases. There's primary, and after primary, you go to uh, tactics. In primary, you fl always have an ins you, you have an instructor with you, and our instructors were civilians, and it was in the uh, Cessna L-19, or o it, then it became changed the name of it to the O-1. It was an O-1A or a T-O-1D, which was an instrument version of that airplane, which is a tail dragger, single engine Cessna with a O-470 engine in, which is 200 and 230 horsepower little airplane. Very, mm. very good little airplane for getting in and out of short places, and you could loiter around, and you could come in at 50, 60 miles an hour. You could loiter around, and, and when I flew those at Fort Sill spotting artillery later, with the right wind, and you dropped the flaps, you could, you didn't have to make turns. The wind would, you could stay in position and spot artillery. For your student, you'd have a student in the back becoming an artillery observer. So we did that for primary and then tactics. They had one military instructor and three students, three airplanes. The ins military instructor would be with one student. The other two students would either meet him someplace in the air or fly formation on him or he'd, he'd teach you how to fly formation and that kind of thing. And we'd fly in and out of little... Um, road strips, uh, little strips on the side of hills, uh, just the kind of thing you might meet in, in Vietnam. So they were preparing you even though preparing, you didn't know Preparing for, you know, a tactical non-airport environment, just a clearing in the trees type thing. 
And a lot of these little places would be next to a farmer's field, and a farmer would have at the end of his field uh, uh, a cooler with ROC Coca-Cola and have bags of uh, peanuts they'd be selling and stuff like that. <laughs> I could never afford the peanuts. We're, I never had any money because I was married at the time. And, <laughs> 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 uh, and in Vietnam, I never had any money. It was funny, too, because I was still married to that gal. Went to Vietnam, and in Vietnam, we were allowed to draw $100 a month pay. The rest of it had to go home. All out of the whole three hundred something bucks, three hundred bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, then she left me. <laughs> as soon as I came back, I still didn't have any money because that was gone. <laughs> it yeah. was interesting. Were you married after you joined the service or before? And the, my uh, my wife started off as one of my students when I was a dental assistant. Mm -hmm. She was in the WAC. Remember, they used to have a separate group that was uh, within the women. Yeah, the Women's Air Corps. And, well, women's not Air Corps. It was uh, Army Corps. Women's women. Army Corps. Yeah, I guess, yeah. And they had their own barracks and stuff like that. And we had about half of our students would be female and half male. The same with my class. When I went through, about half the students were female and male. I just happened to be the class leader. Um, but I met Maureen. Uh, there, and she stayed on there as uh, working uh, in the school, and then um, I forget what she did or how she worked it. She got out of the Army. Mm -hmm. She didn't complete her term, when, but we remained married and then uh, went through, went off to uh, Vietnam, and she found greener pastures. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned, so you graduated as a chief warrant officer in Fort Rucker, and did you go directly well, to I Vietnam? Well, I just, I graduated as a warrant officer. Warrant officer, not, okay, warrant uh, officer. W-1, and then uh, was after I got to Fort Sill after Vietnam that I became a chief warrant officer. Okay, so from Fort Rucker, where did you go? Fort Rucker, I went uh, immediately to Fort Ord, California, and trained with the 17th Aviation Company had the airplane I was going to fly in Vietnam, the Otter. And I believe that's what... Yep, that's... In fact, I've flown that airplane. Uh, the single-engine Otter. And... Uh, and that's the de Havilland U-1A? U-1A. It has an R-1340 engine on it, just 600 horsepower. It's, a, it's geared. That's the same engine that's in a T-6, the Air Force airplane, mm -hmm. their trainer except that only has a two-bladed prop. This has a three-bladed prop, so their prop turns at a different speed. The airplane can go faster. This airplane will only go 105 knots. Wow. But it's got triple-slotted Fowler flaps, and even the ailerons droop 15 degrees. And this airplane, it, it looks very simple, but when you put the flaps down, it actually changes the incidence of the tailplane. So this was originally going to be called the King Beaver. And when de Havilland built it, and they lost three of them, breaking up in flight because they were having a difficulty between this working of coordinating the tail to the mm -hmm. flaps. Um, once they got that fixed, that is still in use today in Alaska and Canada. And a lot of them, they'll replace this um, R1340 with either a uh, turbine engine or a Polish 1,000 horsepower engine with a four-bladed prop. That's what the only thing that airplane missed was having a problem was it didn't have enough power. Mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam, uh, shortest strip we worked with the 18th Aviation was 800 feet end to end total length of airport because you can't use all of it. Yeah. But uh, this airplane will get will clear a, a 50 foot barrier. Whenever you talk about airplanes, performance is always based on a mythical 50 foot barrier coming in or going out. And this airplane requires a thousand and fifty feet 
at gross weight of 8,000 pounds to clear 50 feet. Well, once they get in Vietnam for a while and they've eaten all that dust and dirt, mm -hmm. and they build up a lot of weight. After you had that airplane in use for six months, you'd take it in for some service and stuff, it might have gained three, 400 pounds. That's amazing from, from the dust and everything. Dirt and stuff in the belly and stuff gets underneath. And we would routinely change our airplanes from one part of the country. One part of Vietnam is wet. The other part's the dry season, wet season switches because of the way the terrain is there. Mm -hmm. So we would routinely move our airplanes from one group to another group because after a while the radios would start acting up in the wet. You'd switch them, I'd clear it right up. Wow. And just get them in the dry for a while. Mm -hmm. Even though they they routinely stay in their area. We had airplanes uh, in Vietnam. I was in uh, the 18th headquarters at that time was Nha Trang. And that's where I showed, we came into Saigon by commercial air. Then they flew us by Otter up to Nha Trang. And... Uh, show us around what were the different strips and then they gave you options on where you wanted to be in country oh really so you had an yeah, option they of... they ask you where you wanted what platoon you wanted to go to there was a guy i went to that i went to training with at fort ord that he and i had kind of a run-in a captain and i wanted to let him see that i could be he and i could get along so i asked to be in his uh unit and so I went to uh, Pleiku, which is in Central Highlands. Okay. So the first six months I was in Pleiku, and then they had an opening for myself and one other warrant officer to fly an airplane out of Quignon, which is on the beach. And uh, so the, my, last, my second six months I flew out of Quignon, just myself and another classmate. So it was a pretty tight group if you were yeah, all classmates. Yeah, just and we did. We, was, we had one airplane, two pilots, and an enlisted uh, crew chief. And we did our tr the army was pretty f front reaching in a lot of ways at that time because, you know, maintenance on airplanes, every hundred hours they had to have certain work done. Mm -hmm. Well, they had developed a rolling program where the crew chief would keep track of the number of hours, and he said, so many hours, I'm gonna have to change the generator. Well, we're gonna be at such and such strip so long, he would, he would tear an airplane down while we're taking some people in and do work little by little by little and keep that airplane going so it didn't have to be in a shop for a week at a time with stuff done. So you're he would always do active certain then. inspections he was doing on his own and rolling wow. and keeping track of it. It was a really amazing amount of responsibility for a, a PFC or Spec 4 to have. Yeah, and how old would he have been? Oh, well, I was 20, I was, I was old, I was uh, 24. And uh, so they, you know, 19, 20. That is a lot of responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So you had mentioned you were at Fort Ord for training in the Otter. How right. long were you in Fort Ord? And that was in California? That was in California. Um, I'm not sure how long Otter training was because something screwed up. I went through, I got there, and it was other classmates of mine that had come out. Um, and uh, it seemed like the class was about four weeks, but a funny thing happened. I went through ground school with everybody. We all were in the same ground school. And then they were transitioning at the 17th Aviation Company from this airplane, the Otter, to the Caribou. Twin engine to Haviland, high, high tail, ramp in the back type airplane. So their pilots were really wanting to get into the new airplane. And they had guys off training on the Caribou. So they were short on instructors. I got left out. So these guys were all going and doing, well, and I check in with them every day. Don't worry, Mr. Vian, we're going to get you that. With well, the um, W3, it was going to be my, eventually ended up with my trainer, um, 
Cullen, his name was, loaned me his 1950 Ford, that pea green that those Fords, a lot of them were. And I spent day after day running around Monterey, checking the valley out, stuff like that. And then just about a week before we were supposed to be through with the whole program, I hadn't done anything yet. He came and we went off in an airplane and he showed me how to taxi it, how to fly it and so on. And uh, uh, we went over to this crop duster strip in Salinas Valley and he had a friend that had that crop dusting business and he said, Mr. Vion, I want you to go off and get three hours of duel, which meant I just had the airplane by myself, no crew chief or anything. I'd take off and come in and land. This particular airplane that I had, there's a door on the other side in the back. If you didn't land it perfectly smooth, the door would fall open. I'd land, the door would open. I'd have to set the parking brake, leave the thing running, get out of my seat, go to the back, close the back door, climb back in, hook up my seat belt and shoulder harness, put my helmet back on, check out <laughs> take off. And uh, I never carried a load in an airplane. They, one of the things they did, they went down to Fort Or, uh, another, not Fort Or, we were at Fort Or, Fritchie Army Airfield was where we were. Um, they, they went hauling loads in different size loads. Mm -hmm. and I never did any of that. I went and had a check ride with a guy named John Lawyer. Well, the column was Fox Peter Cullen, F.P. Cullen, and then John Lawler was a W-4. Now, by this time, these guys were former Marines. Mm -hmm. They had been, for some reason, they had been a major in the Marines, but they were rifting them because they'd go make their next promotion. But the Army now was looking for pilots because they see Vietnam coming on. So they, we had Air Force guys, Navy guys, Air, uh, Marine guys, and so on that were brought in were former commission officers that came into the Army as senior warrant officers. Wow, that's unique. Instant rank. But they had a lot of experience, so they knew a lot of mm -hmm. great stuff. But one of the guys I flew with in Vietnam, when I was checking him out when he came through, is the, we went into a place called Giavuk in Tukor area. And I was showing him what it was like. So Special Forces camp, and it was down in a valley. It was pretty hairy because anybody could shoot at you from any angle. And he said, I was telling him about it, and he said, it looks a little different than it did last time I was here. I said, I thought you just got here. He said, well, I was here in World War II. He said, this was a Jap Zero base in World War II, and I strafed it with a P-38. And then he was now, he was now flying for the Army. And, and before that, he is one of the guys that flew P-40s for Claire Chenault, ended up back in the Army Air Corps, flew P-38s in the Pacific, ended up in... Now, remember, that wasn't Vietnam then. It was French Indochina, right? right? And now he's back in Vietnam flying an army otter. That's unbelievable. Yeah. All That's a kind there. of, and keep in mind, when we put on, like, now the guys have actual armor. Mm -hmm. We had a flak vest. It was World War II stuff. When I went to basic training at Fort Knox, it was the M1 World War II. Uh, in fact, the weapon I carried in Vietnam was an M1 carbine, 30 caliber carbine. Small, you could carry it. And I started off, I thought it would be really cool to carry a submachine gun. Uh -huh. and, I had, and I got a um, grease gun. You ever see those? I have. They look like a grease gun, 45 caliber, dangerous weapon, because it shoots from the open bolt position. Do you know what I mean by I that? I do. I okay. So it had a little cover that you open. If you pull the bolt back, you could close the cover, and it had a little, like a little finger and keep it from shooting. But if you accidentally had that back and the cover closed and you pulled the trigger, when you open it, it's going to fire one round. <laughs> had it happen to me, happened to my roommate. 
both of us decided, plus carrying a 45 ammo was a 30 round magazine. You have a thing that carried three of those plus the one in the magazine, too heavy for a 30 caliber. Were they army issue the grease guns or were those? Yeah, well, in those days, you could pick up a weapon almost anywhere in Vietnam. You could pick it up downtown, <laughs> blind black market type yeah. stuff. Um, but in fact, we used to have to get down there and get our parachutes back when they'd steal them out of our airplanes at Plate Coup. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And uh, one night, one of the guys in our unit, they were the COs had no more than stealing our parachutes. Because we're a single engine airplane. We like to be able to have an option at night to, you know, something to happen. And uh, so they put one of our, uh, they MPs, local MPs, in the back of an otter, and then went up, did a little flight around, come in, parked it, and tied it down as if it was going to be parked for the night. That guy's still sitting back there in the crew chief seat, and he has a uh, shotgun. 12 gauge shotgun with double up buck. And sometime after it got dark, you could grab those doors back there, even if they're locked, and you just hit it hard enough, it would pop mm -hmm. open, just like I was talking about when I was doing my landings right. in California. He could pop those doors open, the door pops open, and he yells at the guy out there, and the guy out there didn't stop, and he shot him. It turned out it was a VNAF guy. Vietnamese Air Force. That's who was stealing our parachutes, was the Vietnamese Air Force guys and selling them on the market. For extra money. For, yeah, and so this guy got immediately, tr he had, uh, I think the rules were he had to pay for the round he shot this guy with, and he killed him, and transferred out. I think he went to the Philippines for the rest of his wow. tour or something like that. Built a lot of those back walls. Oh, yeah. And the fact they charged him for the, the shot. But, you know, the Vietnamese weren't very happy losing a guy. Right. Uh, but we never had any parachutes stolen after that. I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned, so you were at Fort Ord, and they, did you get verbal orders that you were going to Vietnam? Did they give you much time? Oh, no, I already had my orders okay. prior. When I graduated from flight school, I was going to Vietnam with an en route stop at the 17th at Ord to train in the airplane I was gonna fly in Vietnam. So then you were, you mentioned you took a commercial flight to Saigon. Right, they, in fact, the day I uh, did my check ride, I did the check ride and they put another guy in the airplane and they f gave me a hop. Uh, they took an otter and flew from Fort Ord to um, Travis Air Force Base and dropped me off so I could go to Vietnam. Wow, so you completed that <laughs> flight training and they put you on the plane. Right, right. And so you mentioned you went to Vietnam, you flew into Saigon, and then... Then up to Nha Trang. Nha Trang, which is up, is that Core 2? I think it's north of Cameron Bay. Yes. Yeah. Let me see. Right. Yeah, here's a better one. Here, here's Nha Trang right here. Yeah. Here's Nha Trang. So I went, come into Saigon, and after the Trang, I ended up over in uh, Plague Coup, right here. So I spent six months here in Plague Coup, and then six months over here in Quignon. And I was at Quignon when they had the uh, biggest terrorism. They call it now terrorism. We didn't call it terrorism then, but in the VFW magazine of last February was the anniversary of, uh, in 1965, February 6th, I think it was, I'm not sure. February 10th, I read the same article the right. other day. Uh, I was in a hotel on the beach in Quignon and they blew up the enlisted hotel down the street from us. And it was this the Viet Cong that? Yes. Uh, two guys come running up the street with suitcases, each of them full of C4 compound and they had a little striker fuse on, like you pull it and that lights the fuse mm -hmm. and ran into the hotel, just like a suicide bomber anywhere mm -hmm. would do. And uh, fortunately, they allowed our guards in those days to have bullets in their weapon. And they killed one of them, but one went in. Oh, that's all it took. The entire hotel came down and it was stacked up 
I have pictures of it, and you probably saw those pictures. I it did. looked like a wedding cake. Yeah, and, it, made and it, was, uh, uh, it was housing U.S. enlisted personnel, I believe. We took our otter and started taking survivors out as they got them. The last one that came that we took out of there, and I just talked to my old stick buddy, Will Roach. Will retired from the Army. He's 81, I think he said. Now he's... he. Um, He's down at um, Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. Yeah, yeah. And um, he did two tours in the Otter. But um, I talked to him about our incident. We had took this survivor out, and this was like three days afterwards. And, and we'd been waiting there on the ramp. We'd go grab a meal, hit the can, stuff like that, and we'd be waiting in the airplane, ready to go. Mm hmm but after three days, you're thinking, this is stupid because and we're going to take them to the 8th Field Hospital in the Trang. But that's about a 45-minute to hour flight in an otter. Well, that's too long. They have caribous can go 60 knots faster than us. A Queen Air could go 70 knots faster than us. There's Air Force airplanes that are faster. There were doctors by that time in Quignon. Well, we, we took this guy, the last one they drug out of there, and by then is the medic is trying to keep an IV in him, mm -hmm. but his veins are all collapsing. He's three days without drinking or anything. Yeah. And, he, and uh, about 10 minutes before landing in the Trang, they lost, he died. That's too bad. It really made us mad. Made us so mad. And I, when I talked to Will, on when that article came out, I said, did did you see this? He said, I hadn't seen him, but he said, you know, that young man should still be alive and been on our hearts all those years. It's the same thing. That is Ticked really too bad. Off. Yeah, I read that after the bombing, it killed 23 U.S. soldiers with, and also seven civilians. Right. And that was February of 1965. Right. Um, Things started cranking up then. Yeah, because wasn't it, I think the Gulf of Tonkin was August of 64 when you were right. already in country. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was it like before that you had mentioned before you were considered an advisor when you first well, arrived? My job didn't change much. I was still hauling people in and out, but now I might be hauling Americans. Okay. And, and I went in and out of special forces camps. And this is kind of interesting, I think. You know, a guy gets jump pay, right? I've heard that. Right? And I get flight pay, he gets jump pay. But he's in Vietnam. He's a, a A team. I, don't know, there's, I think they split the A teams because they might be only five or six guys there, you know. And then they have their own personal bodyguards. These Chinese nungs. You heard about them? I have. So yeah. They, they were the they bodyguards. They had these nungs that watched them to protect them from the guys they were training, because they had the same problem in Vietnam that they're having in Afghanistan and Iraq. The guys you're training are killing you. Mm -hmm. So yet you, you want to go to sleep occasionally. So they'd have these Chinese nuns who are mercenaries, who they were getting paid separate. They weren't in the Vietnamese army. They were hired by the special forces to protect the special forces guys. That's amazing. Did they bring? So they brought them in from where they? From? They're, they're, the nuns are there in Vietnam. But there are definitely a Chinese group of they call mm -hmm. them the Chinese nuns. And uh, they would hire these guys. And these guys had been around with the French and stuff like that. So, you know, back when I was a kid, 54. That's when DNV and Fu was, mm -hmm. in 54. So these guys had a lot of experience, you know, or the child of the guy, yeah, <laughs> that type yeah. of thing. But some of them were pretty old. Uh, but these Special Forces guys would have to jump. So we'd take them in otter. And we fly them up, and they'd probably jump out 700 to 1,000 feet on a static line and get their jump in so they could get their pay. Well, I went to a couple places, and I said, are you sure you want to jump? Well, we want, yeah, we want to get paid. I said, look, there's punchy stakes all over here. If you drift across the river here, you're in Cambodia. There's bad guys there. You know there's bad guys all around your camp. Your minefield's over here. 
you can only land in this area. Mm -hmm. And then what if you get hurt? The team's going to be down a guy. You don't really need to do this. We want to get paid. I said, well, as long as I take those parachutes back popped, they think you jumped. What do you mean? I said, well, if you guys go get, hook it up to the airplane, run out there a ways, I'll bet that parachute comes out. And then we'll bundle them all up in the parachute bags and we'll take them back. In fact, that's how I got some of my souvenirs because these guys like that kind of thinking. Yeah, and you save it's them. It's practical from... not to kill somebody. Right. We'll catch up on f jumps later. And it's surprising they didn't have it like a designated jump area that was safe that you would just jump. Well, then you'd have to take them right. away and there wouldn't be anybody to cover them. And I can't do it. And so you were flying people in and out of the special forces camps? Special forces camps. Here's a tip. We have a courier. And a courier might go from Pleiku to Kwantum to Kuang Nai. That later became a different area. But Kuang Nai to Quinyon, stop and have lunch. Quinyon to um, uh, Tuiwa. Tuiwa to Natrang. Natrang to Bami to it, and then back to play coup. That'd be a two core North courier. We also had a South courier. Now, when we leave play coup, we'd have the mail for all these different places, mm -hmm. and we'd have a movie. In those days, you had a 16 millimeter movie. In the big cans. Right, big cans. Well, we take the play coup movie and give it to Quantum. We take their movie and give it to the next guy. I take that, and then that's the way we'd, so everybody have their entertainment. We bring in the mail. Some of the special forces camps, if we weren't taking, if, if a new guy was coming in, we brought him in. If a guy was rotating out, we took him out. We medevaced. We did their jumping. I've had a couple of times where we were out, they were looking for long range patrol. Mm -hmm. These guys might go out for four or five days and they didn't come back. And we'd be out with their, their little radios with the door off of our airplane talking back and forth and trying to get them to give us some clicks. They didn't really want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew this, but the Army, besides the airplanes I flew, I mean, we flew in Vietnam. The Army flew the bird dog that I told you about, the beaver, which we used a beaver in flight school for instrument training, mm -hmm. three students and one instructor. That was C phase. That's when you got your instrument rating. And helicopter guys didn't typically get instrument rating. They were only taught to fly the helicopter by looking out in their eyeballs. Wow. That's why helicopters have the accidents mm -hmm. they have. They, they get into weather, they're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I think they're starting to train them more on instruments, but they really don't have the training on instruments. And a helicopter is a little bit trickier to fly on instruments than an airplane. Well, a whole lot trickier. Anyway... Um, uh, these special forces guys were kind of out there on their own. What were those camps like? Did you spend much time or did you just land and either drop off personnel, pick things up and... Yeah, and I have some pictures. They'd be typical surrounded by punji stakes, concertina wire. Mm -hmm. um, at each corner of a camp, they might have a 55-gallon drum dug in, facing out at an angle. And in that drum, they would have a homemade deal of napalm. Okay. Which, and they would add into that charcoal and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And what they were trying to do is just like in the old castle days of the flaming oil and stuff. Yeah. They want, and they have a charge in the bottom of that barrel. So that if they set it off, they could send it out. Also around the perimeter, they would put out their um, Claymore mines. Mm -hmm. Familiar with the Claymore? I am. Yeah. And you, know, you had to check those things so that this side towards enemy, well, if you weren't careful, they can sneak in at night and turn them around and then make noise so you hit it. And it comes back into... It got you. So um, they would have a, a, a trough, a steel trough shaped like an arrow, mm -hmm. like a tetrahedron at an airport, when, when they pour fuel in that. So that if they're under attack at night, 
they could light that and point to the direction of the enemy for Puff. Remember Puff the Magic Dragon was a Air Force C-47 yeah. that had a Gatling gun on it, and they could support these bases, but they had to know where they were shooting. So these guys would aim their little arrow out at them. I never spent a night in one of those places. but uh, My closest to something like that was, I don't know if you're familiar, in uh, 65, the um, I'm trying to think. I can't remember the name. Of it. it says South. You know, you had the South Vietnamese, mm-hmm. and then the local indigenous people who were with the South Vietnamese. They're more tribal. I'm trying to think of the name of them. They're mostly up in the Two Core area, and that they're the mountain people, mountain yards, the mountain yards, the mountain yards would always be subservient within the military uh, within the. Vietnamese army Mm -hmm. to a Vietnamese officer and Vietnamese NCOs but these guys are the guys you could really trust the mountain yards they're the real fighters in our opinion at that time and uh, they had a coup and they killed the Vietnamese officers and enlisted guys and I had a the two corps deputy commander, I flew down to Bami Tuat, which is down south of Nha Trang. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, south of Pleiku. And he, his name was Fritz Freund. He was a bird colonel at that time. And he, the reason that he got down there was he spoke French, and these guys could speak French. Mm-hmm. And uh, he went in there, and they told me to. St- we took a hit going in. Because we had to make an instrument approach to one airport and come low level over to where he wanted to go. And, and we got shot up, probably by friendlies. And, um, well, you know, the Vietnamese. Right. But. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he told me to stay there. And I think I stayed there three days bombing clothes and stuff off people. And, you get, and uh it was another unit there, but not an aviation unit. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, we got relieved. But uh, he, I think, got t- made it to three stars before. Wow. I saw he's buried at uh, West Point. Okay. And you mentioned you were part of the 18th Aviation Company. Yeah. And I noticed the nickname was Low, Slow, and Reliable. Right. And you mentioned you served for the a The 18th, by the way, was a first fixed-wing Army unit to go to Vietnam. Wow, okay. And it was the last fixed-wing Army unit in Vietnam. That's my understanding. That's a long time. Yeah, they were there about 10 years, close to 10 years, way before it became a combat situation. Yeah, and you mentioned before um, the Gulf of Tonkin, you were part of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, or as you right. call it, MACV. Right. And was there a transition once the, after the Gulf of Tonkin and they passed a resolution? Well, I was not... I have to tell you one thing. It actually served me well in Vietnam. A lot of stuff would go past me. Because yeah. I remember guys saying, remember when we were doing such and such and that? I didn't know what was going on. I was just, they tell me to take something someplace. I didn't know actually what was going on. Mm-hmm. You just did your mission for I the just plane. did what I was supposed to do and came back out. And these guys were all excited about it because they were paying attention and knew what was going on. Uh, that I found out at reunion since. They always, the one guy thought I was such a cool cut. I had no clue <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> what was going on. But it was kind of interesting that he'd have that feeling about me. Yeah. Because I'm not really that, I'm not the kind of guy that would, I'll tell you one last story. One, I don't know if you heard this story coming down the coast one day. A helicopter pilot, this is in 65, spotted a ship all covered with palm trees and stuff hiding it. And it was a German ship bringing in arms to South Vietnam. And they spotted this thing and they started taking fire from it. And then the Air Force was bombing it, the Navy was bombing it, the Marines were bombing it. The army caribous were flying overhead and dropping mm-hmm. flares over it at night and stuff like that. These guys were all, and I was at the club in the train because I was just getting ready to get out, out of Vietnam. And uh, 
our airplane was down getting some work done on it in the train. And these guys were all coming in, what exciting it was, and the fire, and it had, they said it had pom-pom guns on it. I thought, wow, it's like World War II, uh -huh. you know? And uh, I thought, wow, that's something, isn't it? And they came and said, Mr. Vion, we have a mission for you. Okay. And uh, they wanted me to fly out and take pictures of that ship. Mm -hmm. Like two days after they started attacking it. And I said, well, what's the situation there? Because remember that hotel I told you about they blew up in Quignon? Yes. When they blew that up, we're waiting at the, waiting at the airport for more survivors. They said, nobody can fly right now because they're sending in an RF-101 from the Philippines to take pictures of that hotel. And we're there, oh, what to see this. Boom. Wow, what was it, huh? They take pictures doing that? <laughs> this guy's just cranking going through. So they tell me, so I had that in my mind, and they tell me now I'm going out and take pictures, and what they've done, they removed that big door I told you out in the back, and they have this sergeant first class with a 35 millimeter camera, one of them long lenses mm -hmm. on it, sitting back there where the crew chief would usually sit, and me and another warrant officer are supposed to fly out there and take pictures of that ship. And I said, well, is there anything going on out there? We don't have any information. They just want you to take Sergeant so-and-so out and get pictures of it. I thought, well, I planned to fly it about 30 feet above the water, hoping that they couldn't depress any guns that were left low right. enough to hit us. And I told these guys that was my plan. They said, okay. So we get out there, and by this time now, I'm kind of rethinking my plan, and I'd say I was about a mile from this ship. You could see it off to the side. The ship looked about the length of this piece of paper to me. That's how far away mm -hmm. I was, and it was a long, big ship, 200-foot or 250-foot ship, maybe bigger. And I said, hey, Sarge, how good a lens you got in that camera? He said, I've got a great lens. I said, take a shot of it right now. He took a shot of it, and I said, I said, you need any more? He says, I'm completely satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around and flew back and landed. But so that was my one opportunity to get a distinguished flying cross, and I came up with another way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm no hero there. But you did serve in Vietnam. That's, a, that's quite a bit. Um, so you were there to the end of 65, correct? Pardon me? You were in Vietnam till the end of 65? Right. Well, till March of 65. March of 65. And, and then, then I then that's when I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Okay, so they... Checked out in the Caribou. And guess what? I checked out in the Caribou, and guess where they were going? Vietnam. I flew on as far as Hawaii. I transpacked the Caribou from Hamilton Air Force Base to Hickam Field, Hawaii, an Army Caribou at 6,000 feet took us 14 hours and 45 minutes. Now I ended up as a commercial airline pilot flying MD-11s to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. It took us two hours longer to fly to Hawaii in that caribou than it did on my worst possible day in an MD-11 going to Tokyo from Atlanta. So. What was that like in a caribou across the Pacific? It was interesting because the guy I was flying with uh, just wrote a big story about it in the Army Otter Caribou Association. Oh, things. really? Yeah. I'll he talked about we, we had the airplane, and we were going from um, Dallas, Texas to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to have our radio altimeter worked on. And we're right over um, McAllister, Oklahoma, and number one engine impeller blew on the, turbo, on the supercharger, and oil was coming out. I went back and looked, and oil's coming out of the engine. We've got to shut it down. We feathered number one. And we're right over McAllister Airport, and he said, what's down there? And I said, I'll tell you one thing. We don't want to go into McAllister. I've been there. Because when I was at Fort Sill, we used to go to um, Arkansas. What's it? Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. No, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And we go right over McAllister. One day we had to go in there. The only thing there is a state pen. 
you don't want to go there. I said, let's go to Tulsa. So he said, okay, we went up to Tulsa. Well, it turned out it's like God being your co-pilot because Tulsa, Oklahoma at that time had a C-97 outfit, uh, Air Force tankers, mm -hmm. KC-97s, prop airplane. It was a big Boeing four-engine uh, strato cruiser, but the military version of it. So we could taxi right into one of their nose hangers. The other thing that's at Tulsa, Oklahoma is Spartan School of Aviation, a technical school for mm -hmm. aviation. They rebuild R2000s. That's an R2000 hanging on the airplane. We signed for an R2000 on a Form 44. They brought it over and those guys started taking our old engine off and putting a new engine on. The next day, they had everything ready to go. We test flew it for a couple hours around, came in and pulled the screens. Everything looked good. And uh, we flew it nonstop to, um, we were heading for Hamilton Field in California. We couldn't get in because it was fogged in. So we landed at Travis Air Force Base, sat there for two hours. Lynn flew to Hamilton, 12 hour flight plus a stop the whole unit's there except for us because we had lost an engine. They said, the best winds we've had in six months, we're gonna leave at five o'clock this afternoon. Can you guys do it? We said, yeah. Said, we never went to bed, we never checked in anywhere or anything. There's only two of us flying this thing. And off we went 1445 to Hawaii. Wow, that's amazing. At 6,000 feet. Then I got relieved because the two planes ahead of us we had no nav whatsoever on board, by the way. We're following visually uh, two other airplanes, and one of them has a nav. They have a Doppler and Loran, the old way we used to do things where you match the radio waves and uh, mm -hmm. so on like that. But one of them lost a hydraulic pump, so they're, they both turned around and went back. But we didn't want to turn around and go back because we're really heavy. And you can't dump fuel or anything because this is not a good airplane to land now. So you want to keep going. And uh, so we just held our heading. And I think every hour he changed our heading a couple of degrees to the right, it seemed like. And Ocean Ship November was out there, which was a light ship halfway to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, they told us to make another five degree change. And by then, our ADF, we could pick up, uh, I think it was KGMB in Hawaii. And you get that, da, da, do you get the point? And you you know, you're, when you're flying something like that, you're supposed to put the needle here, and then you know the wind is such and such. We didn't do that. You put it, just put it on the nose. You, you probably fly this big loop in order to get there, but you get there. If you just follow the arrow, you'll get there, but you might go the long way, you know. <laughs> so then you landed in Hawaii. Um, did you decide to leave the military, or did they ask for you to re-enlist? Uh, I had, we were flying at that time T-41s. It's another system, a tricycle. It's like a 172, mm -hmm. only a military version. It had a bigger motor, bigger gear, and stuff like that on it. Nice little airplane. And these, I came in one day from, uh, f I was in a Pershing missile unit with bird dog flying them back and forth and watching out for them and stuff like that. These guys come in and said, hey, we're taking our commercial pilot's license today. We didn't have a license, we're army. Mm -hmm. And apparently these guys had been studying for about a week for the written for commercial pilot's license. And I said, hey, I'm gonna see if I can take it too. The FAA was out there at Fort Sill. Well, Funny thing was, we all went and took the written. I was the first one finished, I remember. And I thought, oh boy, I must be doing something wrong. And I passed. And three of those guys had been studying for a week, busted their commercial pilot's <laughs> license. I couldn't believe it. But then we all had our commercial pilot's license. We flew six T-41s down to Love Field, mm -hmm. parked on Braniff's ramp, went in and interviewed. And they hired five of us. Which company was this with? Braniff. Braniff. 
but we were in army airplanes all parked on there. We went in, took off our flight suits, had a sport jacket and stuff in our bag, and went in, and uh, I got hired by Braniff April 5th of 1967. And I got furloughed by Braniff August 5th of 1967, because they merged with Panegra, and they recall guys, and things are cutting back. Braniff is gone now. You mm -hmm. know, they, they went bankrupt a few times. And uh, so then I was working as a baggage smasher at Love Field. Then ended up, I got a telegram hanging on my door. It said, are you interested in immediate permanent employment with Western Airlines? Call this number, collect, and they told me uh, our chief, the chief pilot of Western Airlines was in Dallas looking for pilots because they just merged with another outfit, mm -hmm. Pacific Northern, and that's how I transferred. But interestingly enough, when I got out there, I was a flight engineer in the Lockheed Constellation, so I wanted to keep my hand in flying. So I went to find an Army outfit to get in. There's Army Guard, Army Reserve. I went to a Guard outfit, and the guy, this captain, says, uh, I, they had an airplane there I could fly and so on. He said, but why do you want in here? You've already been to Vietnam. You know, all these guys were, at that time, the Guard didn't go. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if you're in the Guard or Reserve, you'll go before the regular guys go to combat, that is. And I thought, I don't want to be with those guys. So I didn't get in. So you, but then they you... were dodging. They were, they were dodging Vietnam. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, so then you left the service. Um, yeah, in 67. In 67, and then you became a commercial air pilot. Right. And was that your career after? Yes, I retired from Delta in 2003. Wow. And um, how did you adjust to civilian life coming back after a year in Vietnam and seven years in the service? Well, it was okay. I remember a couple of times with Braniff flying with guys, and I was a flight engineer in a Lockheed Electra. And this guy was just a little, you know, you can't do anything about it. Those were the days before you could say too much to the captain. The captain was like God, and the co pilots doing what he says, and the engineer just, you were the, uh, you were what they referred to as a sexual advisor. <laughs> yeah. If they want anything from you, they'd let you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, a couple of times I thought I'd rather be in Vietnam than I would be here. Wow, that's that's yeah. that's something. And a couple of times when I was sticking fuel in the top of a Connie wing in Kodiak, Alaska, and it's snowy and blowing around and stuff, you think, you know, Vietnam was a heck of a lot nicer than Alaska. <laughs> but, and you're flying older airplanes than you were when you were in the Army. <laughs> wow, that, that really is yeah. something. So... I don't know, different. The airline business changed a lot. The Army changed a lot. Uh, they're a lot more professional than we were now. Their pilots brief better, know their numbers better, and it, it's a whole lot better system. We were kind of seat of the pants type people. Mm -hmm. So kick the tire, light the fire type thing and get going. It, uh, a lot of a lot of stuff went by the wayside, particularly in Vietnam. Put the heavy stuff up front and go for it. <laughs> okay. And have you, you mentioned reunions? Have you stayed active in veterans organizations? VFW is about it. And there was one nearby where I was building a house in western Pennsylvania, and I'm still a life member there. And I. I actually want to transfer to the one in Covington, but I haven't had had a chance to get down and find it. And you mentioned I was going to ask if you stay in contact with the fellow veterans, but it sounds like many of your pilots that you serve with you've all been very close. Pretty good. There's only there's only a couple left of my group. We've lost six or seven to Agent Orange related stuff, so particularly the guys that went two tours. I was a single tour guy. You know, I went Vietnam one year. 
the guys that went to Vietnam two years, mm -hmm. they almost all eventually got sick. I consider them, their name should actually be on the wall, I think. Uh, the latest one had pancreatic cancer. Well, that's supposed to be caused by Agent Orange. Uh, everybody in his family lives real long lives, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. So Ray McNew. So. Yeah, was there much Agent Orange um, use when you were there, or did that come? Oh, sure. That's what they'd use. The special Forces would use that to keep the weeds out of their fence. They keep it to keep the weeds out of the runway. Keep the runways when we first got there were a lot of them were pure steel planking. Are you familiar with what that is? I've it's, seen photos. Yeah, that's what we had. Pleiku was pure steel planking. A number of places were what they used in World War II. Is, uh, I've seen it in like shots of the Pacific right. where they've got them right. laid out. Well, almost everything we had was World War II type stuff. We hadn't advanced much then. That's pretty We're interesting. We're always one war behind on tech. The, where they went in the desert on, when they did Iraq, mm -hmm. I talked to a couple of people that picked up prisoners of Iraq people, and they said, how'd you do that? Well, they showed them their GPS. Well, they didn't have anything like that. And that handheld GPS makes all the difference in the world, and these tank guys know where they are what's going on, and they've got a tank that can go 60 miles an hour and shoot and hit something. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have done any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah the advances really are amazing. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions, then we'll wrap it up. How did your military service and wartime experience affect your life? Well, I, I think it as I started this, as I said, when I went to basic training, I think it made me grow up. I think it was good for me. Uh, it helped me be, uh, it really made it easy for me to make decisions, particularly Vietnam. You, you learn to make a decision. You say, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do it. And then you adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're going to, I said I was going to do this, I'm going to do it. It's, I'm going to do it, and if something happens where I can't, I want to have a way to make a canyon turn and yeah. get the hell out of there, yeah. too. You know, you have a plan and then an alternate. And then when you actually, when things go to crap in some situations, none of that works, you know, just on your own. Yeah. Uh, and um, has your military service impacted your feelings about war or the military in general? Yes, um, I have a little less respect for the higher ranks than I used to, particularly seeing what's going on now. I mean, I think in Benghazi, we had, we had the airplanes, we had the ships, we had the personnel, and we didn't have the leadership. And one of the generals, I think, that was gonna react to that got fired. Mm. So, you know, we could have done something there. And when Pleiku came under attack, the guys, my guys, went over there by truck. And uh, you would never, like the Secretary of Defense said, well, you don't send people in where you don't know what's going on. We never knew what was going on. You never knew when you went into a strip that there were gonna be good guys there or bad guys because there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. The special forces camps over here, maybe half a mile away. So you're out in the boonies. Um, it's a whole different deal. I I remember thinking when I was in Vietnam that Army aviation was part of the problem, more than the solution. Mm -hmm. In that we would take you from here to here to here, and we didn't own any of the real estate in the in the middle. The convoys they get attacked and blown up and stuff like that, and you need to own the real estate. You have to be there at night and day, not mm -hmm. just during the daytime. And I think we're always like one war behind. You know, we're still training as well. I think we're one war out of phase now because the Russians have all their stuff there ready to go into Ukraine. We can't, how are we going to react to that? You can't react to that. Right. We have like a, we have like a, a 
couple battalions of guys up there doing some training with these guys. You know, their only purpose is, right? It's just like the guys when they were in Berlin. Their only purpose is if they get killed, now the country's going to be motivated. Mm -hmm. That's like Korea. We have how many? 30,000, 20,000 there? Well, they're not going to stop the North Koreans. They're going to die. But now we're going to be pissed. That's a problem with us. You know, mm -hmm. it's always like that. I, I'm more for, I'm more of a um, Rand Paul type or a, where Trump says, hey, cooperate. If Putin's going to blow him up, good. Let's be with him instead of we're not going to do that. The same thing with Cuba. Nixon, you know, changed his tune on Cuba. He wanted to, to be in, to get things open up. That's the only thing I can think of that I agree with Obama about. I think open up Cuba, they'll collapse quicker than anything mm -hmm. because the people will see what's available to them. Uh, that's kind of, I'm kind of for, but I'm for borders. That's uh, so why I'd, I'd put the military on the border and have them do their training up and down the whole border and stop the drugs and stuff. So, in, in closing, is there anything else you want to add about your life, military service, or anything? If I was to do it again, I think I could do a little better than I did <laughs> last time, but I would do it again. I wouldn't hesitate. Um, but, um, and there's also, in the military, in the Army, you learn one thing. If you're going to do something, don't ask. <laughs> it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. That is something that I learned. It really works well in life with the airlines or anything else. Mm -hmm. I was sure you would say that was okay, Colonel. But if you were going to do it anyway and the Colonel says don't do it and you disobey an order, now you're in trouble. So don't ask. That's good advice. It's good advice anywhere. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and on that note, we'll uh, end. And I'll, this is Bill Stoltz, and I am concluding my interview with Roger Vian. And I want to thank you, Mr. Vian, for your service to our country. Thank you.